you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. On today's show, we take a trip to Canada in the company of author, filmmaker and paranormal investigator Jason Hewlett. Jason graduated from film school in the mid-1990s and yet despite taking on a career in journalism, his love of the paranormal remained undimished. Starting off as a solo investigator, Jason has developed his skills with the tether of journalism coupled with his filmmaking expertise to create a more balanced approach to the paranormal. We discuss his early experiences with the paranormal, including investigating the Tronkill Sanatorium, the Bailey House, and joining the Vancouver Paranormal Society. We also look at his documentaries, his current professional relationship with fellow paranormal investigator Peter Wren, as well as a couple of other haunted Canadian locations. You can find Jason and Peter's book right now via Beyond the Fray, and a big thank you as always to Jason for joining me for this week's show. Don't forget you can support the show for $4 a month via our Patreon link in this week's show notes for early access to the show, bonus content and much more besides. You can also find us across all social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and please subscribe to our channel on YouTube. As always, the art for this week's show is by Dean Bestall. The show is produced by Brennan Storr from the Ghost Story Guides, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Now, let's join Jason as he takes us on a tour of some of Canada's most spooky locations. Today, I am delighted to be joined by writer, director, podcaster and investigator Jason Hewlett. With a long interest in the paranormal, Jason has recently launched his new series, We Want to Believe, alongside a newly released book in conjunction with co-author Peter Wren, I Want to Believe. With plenty of paranormal irons in the fire for 2021, it looks set to be another busy year for Jason. Welcome to the show, Jason. How are we? I'm doing good, Paul. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, I've been looking forward to this since it, we were able to book it, so I'm excited to be here. Yes, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's a pleasure to finally speak to you. As, as we were having a, uh, a little chinwag before we, we dove into the, the interview proper, Jason, you're somebody I've been aware of for a, for a couple of years, primarily through your, your appearances on other shows that I regularly listen to, Into the Fray being a prime example. You are a, a multi-talented and multifaceted man with, a, with what seems to be an equal love of, of both horror, film and the paranormal. So is it something that you feel work well together or do you think one has kind of influenced your love of the other over the years? Well, that's actually a really good question, Paul, that I've never been asked before exactly. <laughs> it's, uh, and I, I've never given it a lot of thought. I mean, I've always been into movies. Uh, you know, I was a victim of George Lucas's Star Wars because it was yes. I was five when it came out. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of captured my <laughs> imagination uh, in that sense. So I loved movies from that moment on. Mm. Um, but I remember seeing my first horror movie, which was a movie called The Beast Must Die. Yes. Yes, with Peter Cushing. Absolutely. Um, and it was an English movie as well. Uh, and it was it was something that I think I must have been eight, maybe nine. And it was a matinee on television. And I watched it. And I remember kind of I was young, so I was impressionable. And it freaked me out for weeks um, <laughs> <laughs> at night, especially right. Getting into bed. I thought there was some beast in my closet or underneath the bed or something like that. And that's when I first became aware of fear as an entertainment and was paying attention to, to spooky stuff going on in, in terms of cinema. But I, I'd kind of become aware of weird happenings of a couple of years before that so it's almost like an interest in the paranormal which i couldn't really even describe as a paranormal at that time happened almost in conjunction with my discovery of the horror movie mm. as a genre and i'm pretty sure every person i know who's into the paranormal loves horror movies and it's almost vice versa mm-hmm. so i think they yeah. kind of go hand in hand if that makes <laughs> sense yeah <laughs> yeah very much so it is interesting because i you know, i completely agree i of a very similar generation as yourself and of that uh, George Lucas enticed child that uh, 
whose life changed forever when he saw the beginning of of that saga appear on the the cinema screens and I, I was lucky enough to see Return of the Jedi in, in London in the West End when it first came out because in those days yeah no. if you wanted to see a film as soon as possible in the UK Lon you had to go to London because it would take about three weeks to, to be released to the to the provinces here <laughs> over here <laughs> uh, and, and so I was such an obsessive that uh, my uncle made a we made a trip down to London to see Return of the Jedi in Leicester Square Oh, that'd, that'd be amazing. I mean, I've been to London and I've watched a few movies in London and it's it's a unique experience because the cinemas are just so different than what we have here, right? Like, I'm sure you've got the go-go multiplexes now like we do, but back then it was like, it was a real theater. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a big theater for yeah, watching movies. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, I live in I live in Shepherd, so I'm quite fortunate. There's a couple of lovely uh, cinemas that we've got here. Um, and round the corner from where I live is an original Art Deco cinema from the 1920s that does occasional movie days and they'll show classic horror films or the universal monster films on a day beautiful Be i'm jealous <laughs> <laughs> so for you was it your prime love and your on your professional talent i would say jason is is primarily in filmmaking so is that something that has allowed you to develop your your skills and an appreciation of film because you've actually studied it and worked in it a lot more than most people who simply have a, a love of the genre. Definitely. My love of the genre led me actually to film school, which I did in the early, well, mid-90s, I guess, 1994 is when I went to a place called Vancouver Film School, which greatest claim to fame is Kevin Smith, of course, who did the Clerks movies, mm. uh, and Mall Rats and films like that, and Jay and Talent Bob. He, he went there, and he was a couple classes ahead of me. Mm. Uh, when I started at the school, he had just released Clerks. Um, so he'd been there. He went for the, the length of time it was required to kind of do. The program was in two parts. One was all the the learning technical aspects. And then the second half is you went out and made a few films. So he did all that stuff and then left and made clerks instead of staying in the school and doing, yeah. you know, the, the practical application. So <laughs> I went there and it, it was because I really wanted to work in film. Um, it it interested me. Um, I was naive at the time. I had no idea how hard it was to actually get into the industry. And this was the 90s. So there was no digital. Yeah. Like there is now. There was no Internet. Um, everything was shot on film. It was very expensive to purchase and then process. And if you messed up, it was even more expensive because you had to go <laughs> buy more film. Yes. Um, and so it just it never went anywhere at the time, unfortunately. But I kind of believe everything kind of happens for a reason. So I kind of had that foundation, learned about movies and then kind of went off, did a few other things and started doing movie reviews, um, mm. which led me to eventually to, to a, a podcast and radio show I do now called From the Basement. <laughs> um, so I was like, able to apply my knowledge in that sense of understanding movies and being able to critique them with more than just, yeah, it was good, you know, or, or <laughs> no, it sucked. Yep, yep. Yeah, <laughs> and, which has kind of led to a whole other path that, that eventually brought me around to what we're doing now. Um, because... Through my contacts that I've made doing from the basement, I met people, you know, like like John Fallon, who who runs Arrow in the Head, which is part of the Joe Blow Movie Network, which is now, mm -hmm. you know, they're the people that are putting out We Want to Believe and some other stuff that I'm doing. Yeah. So I, you know, doing I, I interviewed Shannon Lagrove into the fray on on from the basement about her um, on the trail of UFOs. Yes, which eventually led to you know more paranormal work through her and and, and writing the book through Beyond the Fray. So it's it's interesting how going to that school which is already, I hate to say it, like 25 years ago. <laughs> like, yeah. Or, right? Or, or so <laughs> has led me to where I am now. You know, I just sort of was able to take everything I learned back then and it's finally being put to use. But I don't think I could have done what I'm doing now back then. Does yeah. that make sense? Like, it just, yeah. everything happens at a time when it's supposed to, I guess, for lack of a better phrasing. Mm. Uh, mm. Um, I, I think it is interesting because sometimes it, it's almost as if, sometimes feels, Jason, as if life takes an opportunity away from you. And yet, when you look back and you're able to look back on it over, like, as you say there, the last quarter of a century, sometimes it's, it's peculiar how it seems to reappear when you have a better opportunity to utilize your talents and be able to, to perhaps read a wider audience or appeal to more people than perhaps you ever co could have possibly dreamed of at that period during the early to mid 90s I, I agree completely and i don't think i think as a person even you know you know mentally creatively emotionally i don't think i was in the place even to pull this off because you mm. don't realize as a young person you know at that point i wasn't even 25 mm. that uh what it takes to do all this work right like making 
if, if it was an easy job, everyone would be making movies, right? Yes. <laughs> like it really, or, or YouTube content or anything or podcasts. Mm. But it's not. It requires a very much a, a discipline and a work ethic and an understanding and a patience that I just didn't have then. Mm. And I, it, that all needed to be cultivated. I mean, and even in those ensuing years, I was a, a mainstream journalist at a newspaper and a crime writer. And I mean, I... I that taught me a lot about interviewing, you know, and just navigating stress and, and, and you know, all ever changing situations and just, you know, gave me a more of a, a, an understanding of the world and people and how that all works. And then being able to apply that to filmmaking and even an understanding of the paranormal like that, just it all kind of has really come together. So, I mean, it, maybe it, there's much frustration since 94 to now, but it really feels like it's all kind of coming together in a way that it was really meant to do, um, which I, I'm very thankful for and grateful for. Yeah, it's it's almost as if you have to kind of, kind of go through that to, to be able to utilize your talents and, and get more strings to your bow and be able to develop those skills and that inert ability. Because I think one of the key things about being a filmmaker, especially when you're working in, in this kind of documentary style as well, Jason, is that I think a lot of the time you have to be able to understand people, especially when you're dealing with the paranormal as well. I think it allows you to have a better understanding of, of how people react to stressful situations and how they deal with living in these kind of environments that perhaps you wouldn't have looked upon as as balanced as you do now as a as a more mature filmmaker and and student of life i, I agree completely uh and that's something that is i mean you know that a lot of people are creating paranormal content for the internet mm. and not a, you know and in a way like there's a certain i think what i've always tried to do with we want to believe and and some of the other stuff you know as is the approach it with professionalism and create a quality for lack of a better word product and a lot of people just go out and they go into abandoned places and they just shoot it on their phone and then just regurgitate it onto the internet with no real there's no narrative there's no story there's no the you know and you're right these things that are happening especially if you get invited to a person's home or business is, are affecting these people in some way hmm. and you're not just there as the thrill seeker and the glory hunter you're you're there to kind of at least i'm there to tell their story and hopefully bring them some kind of closure or understanding of what's happening to give them comfort because i'm a firm believer that the paranormal isn't something to really be afraid of mm. it, it, it's a natural part of life we just don't get it yet right it, but it's been with us since day one and i think back in the 20s i would have been more in my 20s i'd have been more into like just we what a good time you know what i mean yes and it wouldn't have it just wouldn't have worked i i wouldn't have been i wouldn't be doing it anymore uh, you know like it would have been over very fast i think <laughs> so you need that life experience and to understand people. And I didn't even understand myself. Nobody understands themselves in their early 20s, you yeah, know? Yeah, very true. It just doesn't very... happen. <laughs> yeah, that's my excuse as well, Jason. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> I was just finding myself. That's it. Yeah, finding yourself, fun and frolic, you know, whatever. <laughs> it was all about having a good time. And, and to do this kind of work, I think, professionally, with any dignity, you've got to be a lot more evolved than that. Yeah, absolutely. So when did you start to strike out? and do your individual investigations because that was something you clearly had a passion for Jason so was that something that you'd sort of run in tangent with your your professional career in regards to working in the newspapers and and, and dealing with the crime reports or was that something that kind of you'd always had a an eye on and it was just a hobby or was it something that you wanted to actively develop as a as an interest more than more than a profession i suspect well i had it i was i was interested always like as a child um i was very interested with you know ghost stories and, and you know bigfoot stories and all that uh, you know and i had some kind of personal experiences as well that kind of fostered that and it, but i didn't know what and i was i always wanted to do more with it but i didn't know how mm. You know, and there was nowhere that I could find in, in Western Canada, at least, you know, when I was as I was getting older that had like parapsychology courses. You know what I mean? Because I figured that was about the only route you could kind of really do anything with it was to take these courses and maybe get on with something at a university. But even then, I mm. did, didn't get there was no real discussion or I had no real knowledge pre-internet of like, you know, investigative groups or anything. I didn't know there was anybody in Canada that was doing that. Mm. So it was always more of just a general interest. And, you know, like, a, um, you know, m I'd been to England a couple of times, so I'd always like to go on ghost tours. Yeah. Or pick up books when I was there. Same when I was in Australia and New Zealand and when I was traveling. Um, and as a journalist, there's no way you can do much with that because it it, it kills your credibility very quickly as a serious journalist, unfortunately. Mm. So I never really did much with it, but I was always interested in it. Um, the only time I could kind of marry the two together is when I was in journalism school. 
in the early early 2000s. So I went back to to school late. I did I went off and had all my adventures and decided I was going to become a journalist when I was about you know 28, 29. Hmm. And in journalism school, one of the classes I took was a magazine writing class. And the whole point of the semester is you would craft a magazine article that you'd want to submit. And so I chose the Fordian Times that ah. I wanted to try to write an article for because I'd been reading that for years. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, well-known magazine, not just in the UK, but all over the world for, for Fordian and paranormal information. Mm. So I was lucky enough that I knew a guy who was the caretaker of a place called Tronchial Sanitarium hmm. here in Kamloops. And it was a pl originally was created as a tuberculosis clinic after the Second World War and then transitioned into an insane asylum. And in the 80s, they deinstitutionalized all these facilities in Canada, hmm. or at least in British Columbia. So all the, the people who were patients there were let go and the buildings were just left. And of course, that became the number one spooky place in town after it shut down because yeah. of the nature of what it was. So I was lucky. So in 2003, I knew the guy was the caretaker and I convinced him to let myself and a few other people go on and do an investigation there that would become the basis for this article. So I was able to find someone who had an experience at Tronchio that was spooked them. Um, I found someone in the program that I was in who had access to TV equipment so we could get cameras and audio, knew someone who was a psychic, and then a buddy of mine in the program who was a skeptic. So we all went and spent the night. Hmm traversing around uh, this facility and the events of that night I wrote into this article. And that was the first time I kind of really went out on an investigation and did anything with it mm. in terms of writing an article that never actually ended up submitting. I don't remember what happened, um, but I got a good grade on it. So there was that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of, but it, I kind of got this bug of wanting to kind of, you know, explore on my own. Yeah. The paranormal and, and I had a means to do it. It was just like, well, I can actually go to places and just hang out there and see what happens not really knowing what I was doing at the time. But that's kind of how I was able to really kind of get into investigating on my own and kind of married that with the journalism aspect of where my life was at at the time. Yeah. I think the sanatorium situation that you have in North America is very interesting as well. So I would imagine that this place was built where it was built primarily because of the old-fashioned idea that clean, fresh air was a, was a fantastic way to deal with tuberculosis and keep people outside where they could sort of get their vitamin D, Jason. Yeah, and that was exactly it. And, and where I live here in Kamloops, it's kind of part of that same semi-arid desert belt of like, you know, Las Vegas, Nevada. Mm. So in the summer, it can get hot, like yeah. up into like 40 Celsius, which mm. you double that is 80. So 95 Fahrenheit. You know mm. what I mean? It gets stinking hot and it's dry because we're in the middle of the province. So in theory, that was a great idea for tuberculosis. Um, and I guess it was successful enough. It was built out of town and it's still out of town, like about a 10 minute drive from where I live, which I'm right on the outskirts of, of the city. Mm. Back then it was even further out. It's almost like the middle of nowhere. And um, it, be, it was basically like a, a little city. So it had its facilities, had its cafeteria building. It had dormitories that eventually became, you know, places for the patients to stay. It had the doctors lived on site. There was a school hmm. for people. So it was this own little community kind of out in the middle of nowhere, which also kind of when it was shut down, it was everything was just left. Yeah. All these buildings that you could walk through and there's a tunnel system underneath because in the winter it's the opposite yes. of what it's like in the summer. So we get boatloads of snow and it gets cold. So to move patients and food from building to building, you couldn't go up on the ground. You had to go under it. And so there's this tunnel system as well. Mm. So it's a fascinating place. It's unfortunately now in a huge state of disrepair. Like it's not even safe to go in there anymore. But back then, which is already almost 20 years ago, we could and we had free reign. Yeah. So would you say you kind of cut your paranormal teeth on that, having that beautiful venue on your doorstep where you were able to kind of hone your craft and, and work out what kind of investigator you wanted to be, Jason? Pretty much, yeah. That, that was a great experience because I was able to go back there about three or four times to investigate. But I didn't, like, honestly, I didn't really get good at it or really understand it until I joined uh, Vancouver Paranormal. Mm which was in 2017. So I had not, you know, it was almost like 14 years of just kind of figuring it out on my own. More like, I guess, exploring and thrill seeking than in doing anything serious. But I knew, I knew from the experiences at, at um, Tronk Hill that there was stuff there yeah. and that there was stuff happening. And I started to figure out there was a right way and a wrong way to go about doing it. Hmm. You know, keeping your own personal safety in mind, not just because you're exploring an old building, but just because you're dealing with with a force you don't really get. Yeah. So but joining up with Vancouver Paranormal in 2017, which I basically just did on a whim, 
and working sort of that's how I met Peter Wren and started working with people who had been serious investigators and been doing it for a long time, I really learned very quickly the right way in my mind to go about conducting an investigation. So that took 14 years to figure that out. Yeah. And to do it in a safe manner and a respectful manner um, for everybody involved, yourself and the spirits, yes. <laughs> like kind of thing. So. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so do you think that was something that you were gravitating towards anyway as an individual, Jason, or, and it was just the right fit? It felt like it was the right team for you to sort of apply? Because I think you applied, didn't you, to see because they were, they were recruiting and you applied for the vacancy. Exactly. Yeah, that was exactly it. Um, and I'd wanted to do something more for a long time. I just, you know, become sidetracked in the journalism career. Although whenever I could write about spooky stuff at the paper, I did. <laughs> you yes. know what I mean? I kind of would work it in that way. I'd usually end up in the entertainment section, but whatever. Yeah. Or lifestyle. Um, but I would. <laughs> I write stories about it. Um, but this was like, yeah. I, you know, and then, you know, I ended up getting married and having a, having a son so that you get sidetracked by life. But I continued to have experiences that I couldn't quite understand and that reinforced in my mind that there was stuff out there. But in 2017, I was sitting downstairs one morning. I'd gotten up with my boy. So at that point, he was six, six years old. And he would get up early and my wife and I still exchange mornings. And so he was downstairs watching cartoons on a Saturday morning and I was hanging out at my computer desk working. And I was going through paranormal websites. I don't know why. I just decided to do it that morning. Hmm. And I came across the Vancouver Paranormal site and they were looking for members. And so I just sat there and I just said, well, why not? (laughs) <laughs> and I kind of just applied, sent an email off. And two days later, I got a call from Peter Wren because they wanted you to put your phone number in there. Yeah. And he and I chatted on the phone for about five, ten minutes. There's an investigation coming up. And he said, well, you might as well come along and we'll see what you got. And that was really how it all started. Yeah. It was just that. Yeah. I, it was almost like, like we talked about. It. It's almost just like there was a right time for everything. Hmm. And that moment hit right there. And the first investigation I went on with them was right. It was the Saturday before Halloween in 2017. Fantastic. So where was your uh, baptism of fire, as it were, then, Jason, as, as part of the Vancouver group? It was uh, at a hotel, a rural hotel, about an hour from where I live, um, near a place called Merritt. And, and the one nice, th- one thing with Vancouver Paranormal, like because it was a business, you had to sign a confidentiality agreement. You couldn't disclose the location or, or, yes. or what you found publicly, um, which I respected that. It made a lot of sense to me. Mm. Um, instead of just going, hey, this is where I was, and we did this, and it was really cool, and you, t- you know, tweeted out on social media. These people didn't want to, who run the hotel, didn't want people to know. Mm. And I respect that. But it was, it was a great night. Like, it was... Went in, like, we actually, you know, like, we, there was equipment. <laughs> like, for the first time, I had real legit equipment. Yeah. Like, you know, EMF detectors and motion detectors and cameras that were motion censored and, you know, digital. I use a digital recorder I use as a journalist. We went off into teams and, and explored different parts of the hotel over, like, the entire evening. Uh, I actually got, like, you know, had, like, stuff happened. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? That I was just like, wow. Like, we had a motion detector go off. Mm. We were doing an EVP session that no one could have caused it. It was like something walking back and forth in front of it, which I thought was very cool. And a bunch of us were in the dining hall asking questions, recording, and we all heard a voice say, get out. Clear as day. Mm. And we heard it live. So it wasn't like we went all back and listened. Yeah. Because a lot of the time with EVPs, you only hear it when you play it back. We all heard it and caught it on, on, on digital recording as well. And that, to me, I that blew my mind. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. So... That was quite a baptism. You could say it was a baptism by fire, but what it, it was, you, you, I was hooked. Like, you, that's, you, something like that happens, you're just, you're in, like Flint. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I, it is something I've I found quite unusual, because obviously in the UK, we have a very, as I'm sure you're well aware of, Jason, as someone that's been and, and had a, a few ghostly experiences on the tours that when you've had the chance to, when you've visited our shows. I find it peculiar that there are some places in, in North America that have embrace their spooky reputations and yet from what i hear when i speak to paranormal investigators from north america a lot of places make you sign a confidentiality agreement they don't want that kind of publicity whatsoever is that something that you've seen increase stay the same or do you think more places are becoming aware of bringing people to them for a paranormal visit rather than just a normal traditional visit i think because there's definitely um, more of an embracing of the paranormal in terms of pop culture now mm. uh, with like dark tourism. I think it's becoming a lot more accepted. Like I know there are certain places that do they want you to, they just don't want you to talk about it. Right. Like, and I, that's fair enough, particularly like places like hotels, I guess. Mm. But I know that there's locations that we do go to. They don't care. Right. Like we, we've been to a few. They don't care that we put up 
pictures or, or talk about it. Um, and I know even at Tronquil, they were very much against when I back in 2003 and even into like the, you know, 2010, wanting it known that there was activity there. They thought it was disrespectful to the people who had lived and worked and even died there. Yeah. But now they, they put up, they do, you know, haunted escape rooms and corn mazes at Halloween. You know what I mean? Like they've kind of embraced it now too mm. around the location. So I think in time you're going to find more and more of that being okay. Mm. Um, but there's always people who, as there's just general people who just, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to think about it for whatever reason. And they don't want that attention drawn to them, even if they want our help as investigators to find out what's happening. Yeah. But I suppose at the end of the day, if you're invited in, you've got to respect the wishes of the venue. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's the same, you know, and we, especially like when we do residential investigations, you're going into somebody's home, right? Mm. Like, and a lot of them don't, they're embarrassed about what people will think, <laughs> you know, so we just don't talk about it, especially with residentials. There's the odd one. They're fine. Mm. But otherwise, uh-uh. <laughs> like, it's just very much a taboo subject. Do you think that's had a lot to do with how residential hauntings are portrayed on, on television, Jason? Because a lot of them, it's, it's very showy. And I would imagine that for some people, that's the complete opposite of what they want. Because half the time, they think they're going mad because they're not sure anything real's going on. They're wondering if they're losing control of their minds or they're hallucinating or... You know, they're they're concerned about their mental health, I would imagine, more than anything else, um, than considering that they're their home or they, they may be living with the spirit. Oh, absolutely. And and you know, as investigators, before we even go into a place, excuse me, that's one of the key questions we ask. <laughs> You know, are you, you know, are you, are you having mental health issues right now? Is there a history of schizophrenia in the family? Are you a habitual user of drugs or alcohol? Like that's all questions we ask because a lot of the time that is it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, or, or it's um, people misinterpreting a very natural phenomena, like you know, a house settling, creaky pipes, EMF, carbon monoxide leak. Or, or just really just want it. Like, sometimes, you know, I've encountered people that they love these kind of shows and movies and horror and all that, and they want something to be there. Yes. Even though there's absolutely nothing there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, mm. they want to be a part of an experience like that. Mm. And those people are, are, in their own way, like, dangerous in the sense that they're misled so they can mislead you. Yes. As an investigator, which is where your skeptical nature always has to come into play. Mm. Uh, mm. Definitely. And, and, and you're right. I mean, the TV shows, like the paranormal reality shows, well, quote unquote reality shows, they don't help. And then even like movies and TV shows that are fiction don't help either in their depiction of these events um, in terms of how people respond to it. Yeah. I mean, in my personal experience, having had several of my friends consider me the weird one, Jason, <laughs> um, and therefore, if anything odd is going on, uh, they tend to sort of run it by me, primarily because they know I'm quite open-minded about such matters. You know, I don't suddenly leap to conclusions and suggest that they've got a portal to hell in their cellar or something like that. <laughs> um, but it's always good to be balanced and sceptical. And I think, as you say, that makes a, a very interesting point, especially in this day of multimedia, that mm -hmm. I think a lot of people leap to the conclusion that they want it to be real rather than it actually being real and, and a myriad of, of natural phenomena and especially where we live in the UK you know, if your house doesn't make a funny noise at night it's, it's not really that old no it would be probably very new right yes <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose uh, it's it's one of the things you have to balance, especially when you're doing a residential investigation with the Vancouver team, Jason, that you have to take a lot more than than what we presume to in, into consideration when you do such a thing. Well, absolutely. Uh, and that's something, I mean, Peter and I talked about that a lot, when, especially because he, he lives up in the interior where I do now, too. So he and I work a lot. And we've actually gone and formed our own group, mm. uh, Canadian Paranormal Foundation, just because... You know, he, he would run Vancouver Paranormal, but he lives like three and a half hours away. It became just too hard to do that. So we created our own group and we go out on these investigations in the interior. And it's, yeah, you've got to take so much into consideration when you go into places, be it a business or a home, like the history of the place. And like in Canada, a lot of places are new. Yeah. Er, <laughs> right? Yeah. So there isn't that preconceived idea of there, there being something there that's been there for hundreds of years. So you got to look at like, well, why are people experiencing it? What's going on? What's their family history like? What's the history like in the neighborhoods around? You know what I mean? In the neighborhood, hmm. where are the homes located? There's so much to take in into just to, to understand before you even go into a house, what could possibly be going on there? And the first question we always ask is, what is the most logical, natural explanation? Um, and we look for that first and kind of work our way backwards, if that makes sense. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I find it often very amusing where 
I will speak with people who are very matter of fact and have managed to try and convince themselves the o the other way, Jason, where they they will leap to the most unfeasible natural explanations for what's going on, <laughs> rather than um, I'm speaking with someone fairly recently who keeps finding white feathers in their house. Okay. They're convinced that a bird is coming in and shedding. They've never seen it. They've never heard it. It's not pooing anywhere. It's the middle of winter. I'm, not, you know, it's not the kind of weather you would leave windows and doors open anyway. But they're more, they're more convinced it must be a bird getting into their locked house somehow than anything else. No, and, and that's kind of the extreme of the person who wants to believe, right? Like mm. it, it's, I think some people are just terrified at the idea of what it means if it's true. Because mm. I think. Um, especially in our modern world, especially Western society, which I believe like the UK kind of falls into, we're scared to death of death yes. and the concept of it, right? Mm. So the fact that there could potentially be a life after death <laughs> or, or something that happens after is probably very terrifying because mm. A, you've got to address it's going to happen and B, they don't look at the fact that maybe there's more after. Do you know what I mean? It's just we don't want to think about it. It's scary. If I talk about it, I'm going to be called weird. You know what I mean? Like there's so much of that stigma that goes along with, with accepting that the paranormal could be true. I mean, it, I think it's great to use the Occam's razor theory, mm. but, you know, so rule out everything else first. But if, if, you know, at the very end, the only explanation left is that there's something paranormal going on, then there's probably something paranormal going on, right? And, and it's not something to be scared of. It's just it's just trying to understand it and how it works. Yeah. Um, which there's a bazillion theories on that, which I'd be curious to know what you think it means in the end, because I'm still working on a couple. But um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think every time you you suspect that you've got an answer for it, Jason, in my personal experience, something or a case comes along that basically tips it all upside down. Mm -hmm. And you go, OK, well, that's not the answer then. <laughs> I wonder where it can be. <laughs> so it, it is very interesting because, like you say, I'm one of those people who has been called a sceptic by believers or a believer by the sceptics. And I'd like to think I'm fairly balanced either way in regards to, to what I believe is, is the paranormal. And often I get as frustrated by both sides sort of perpetuating the same lack of information or, or focusing on specific things rather than the whole picture. To, to sort of strengthen the argument for one way or the other, Jason. And I suppose, as someone that does active investigations, that's also a fine line that you have to balance. Oh, absolutely. Like, I, I look at it when we go into a place, either for, like, you know, for the show or for just as the gr a group, you kind of got to go in being a bit skeptical. And then as events start to happen, you got to kind of look at each one in turn because it's very easy you go in, something happens, it's, you can't explain, so, oh, that was paranormal. And then everything else that happens after that is paranormal. Mm. Whereas you got to look at each sort of EVP and each experience you have as its own entity, for lack of a better word, and try to confirm or deny each one in turn. Mm. I think in order to really do a good, jo thorough job as an investigator, I, and I'm sure not everybody agrees with me, and, and that's fine. That's just sort of the, the way I like to approach it. Mm. As, a, as a prime example, there's a place that um, Peter and I investigate a few times called Bailey House, yes. which I know you're kind of interested in talking about anyways. Mm. And Bailey House is a place where we get a lot of activity, right? We never used to, but over the years, it's become more active. And then kind of one night, here's, here's a prime example, like we're doing an EVP session using a spirit box. Yeah. And we were actually getting intelligent responses. So not just, you know, random yes, no names thrown out, but like we'd ask a question and it res would respond. So that's, that's pretty cool. Mm. And then we were in a room which used to be a kid's bedroom, and it's got dolls in it and old toys. Hmm. And we actually had a little toy hammer come off a shelf and land on the floor. And it was there. We, we didn't see it happen, but we were doing we were doing an EVP session. I was walking around, then I kind of we heard and clink and turned around. We even got the sound on, on our recorders and looked back, and the hammer had come off the shelf in a way that it couldn't have fallen off. Yeah. There was nothing that could have brushed it to cause it. It, it came off, and it went, you know, about a foot or so away from the table. Hmm. So that was like, wow. Like, that was that was interesting, and it, it moved on its own. But then, like, a minute later, we actually picked up this moan. Like, it was almost like the Scooby-Doo ghost moan. Yes. In the room. And I heard it, and Peter didn't hear it. I said, Peter, did you hear that? And he's like, what? And I said, there was a moan, like, over here. And he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. He went and he went back and listened on his recording. He's like, holy crap, he got the moan. And then it happened again with both of us there. And he's like, wow. Okay, that was right there. And we were both getting a little freaked out. But then it happened way too consistently. Mm. So we checked out a window near where we were standing at. And it was like February. It was cold. It was windy. And there was a hairline crack in the glass. And that was causing the moan. Ah. 
to come through. But we also that the, what, the wind that was blowing through wasn't enough to go across the room to where the toy was. So mm-hmm. had we just taken the previous experience from minutes ago and applied it to that and hadn't really looked at it and stopped and really looked around to find it, we would have just accepted this moan as being yeah. a ghost. But it wasn't. So that's kind of how we like to approach each thing we experience in, in the course of even one investigation. Yeah, I mean, that is interesting what you were saying there as well. So would you say that it's become more active as you visited it more often, Jason? Or would you say you've become more aware of what to look out for when you do your investigations in that particular property? Well, Matt, that's a, that's, that's a good question. And I know at one point, the Bailey House is, is kind of a, a little farm in the middle of this town. Hmm. Um, and it's made up of a main house. It's a heritage house. And then there's a barn and another outbuilding that's become um, kind of a gift shop. The whole facility is run by Merritt's kind of community group. So early days, there's very little that went on in the house. More stuff went on in the basement of that outbuilding. Hmm. Right. So more activity. And we stopped going for a few years because Peter had some health issues and we had to take care of that. But when we went back, it was almost like the activity moved to the house and more stuff started happening in the house. So it's almost like a little bit of both. I think once it started happening in the house, we started going back more frequently. Then you're going to see stuff. It's like, you know, the more you kind of go to a place and look, you're, you are going to find. Hmm. But it's very been very consistent. It kind of it, it peaked and now it's just sort of stayed yes. at that level. So every time we go there, we get like, you know, a few, you know, three or four different things that happen during the course of an investigation. So I think I think it's one part. The place has become more active for reasons we're not quite sure of, but it's definitely coincided with us going there more and hmm. maybe being more available to it. If that's kind of an on the fence answer to that. Yeah, I think the more you look, the more you find. I do think more places are active than others, for sure. And and I do think we call them travelers, but I do think activity can move. Mm. You know, spirits aren't always beholden to stay in one particular. If they're an intelligent haunting, you know yes. what I mean. They aren't necessarily beholden to being in one spot. Mm. And I suppose it is interesting as well because obviously there is a lot of discussion and conjecture in regards to the fact that over time hauntings tend to diminish rather than increase. So I suppose it all then becomes a question of, well, when did this start? Is it getting mm-hmm. stronger, more regular, because it's growing? Or, as you say, is it performing, because it knows it's it's getting more visitors? Or is it drawing on your energy? Or is it just something, as you say, you become more aware of what goes on there, and therefore, because you go more often, you're more likely to, to notice it. Yeah, and I think it's kind of a little bit of all that. I even know personally, like there's a lot, like there's times I've been super interested in the paranormal and very into it, and I've noticed more. Mm. And then, and then you know, when my son was born, I'm just like, I don't want, no, I don't want to bring him up in an environment where stuff's going on. So I just ignored it, and it eventually all just went away yes. <laughs> for, for a number of years, right? Yeah, so I yeah. think if you're dialing into that frequency, for lack of a better word, I think you you are more in tune with it. And I think some people are naturally more dialed into that frequency. Mm. And so they're the people who experience it more. And then sometimes it just happens and then people, it happens and it scares them. They don't want to know about it. So they just kind of turn it off. Um, there's an author named Colin Wilson. Yes. Yes. Who wrote a book called The Occult. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've read it, but he yes. talks about faculty X and how everyone's got this faculty X. And that's the ability to tune into the paranormal or occult. We all have it. When we were living out on the plains or in you know the wilds before we were very civilized and started living in organized groups, we relied on it a lot more to, for survival. It was it's kind of just been a natural part of the human experience. Mm. And as we've become more civilized and more cultured and started living in more communities and centers with noise and lights and internets and all this stuff, as a whole, we've just become detuned to it. Except for those of us who are kind of a little more wired for that and then eventually go out looking for it and the more you look for it the more you are going to find it and be tuned into faculty x i thought for me that was just a great way for him to explain it this whole phenomenon yeah very much so it, i mean it is one of those things wilson's writings are, are numerous and i have more than several of his books it's primarily his his, his book on poltergeist is is phenomenal mm. I have to read that one still. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I recommend it highly. It's uh, it's very interesting because it, it tends to focus on perhaps a couple of cases that aren't that well known these days. And that's that's the other interesting aspect, I think, sometimes about the, the paranormal, Jason, is that certain cases seem to, to fall out of favour or, or lo- people seem to just completely lose interest in them or certain cases just continue to, to rise to the top and still pull people in, even though... People are, a lot. A lot of people can be very dismissive about certain cases. I'll not name any particular venues, but I think you know what I mean. 
I do. <laughs> Good. I didn't want to cast aspersions on anybody that wishes to promote these, but I think it's very odd sometimes that there are very controversial sites, and yet there are sites where very weird things happens and it just doesn't seem to have the the pizzazz or the rock and roll aspect to it that seems to keep it at the top of the pile i, I agree and i think it because i think maybe part of it um like the more well-known cases you know and i can think of two off the top of my head are they're the ones that kind of get the media attention mm. when it's very when it's happening does that make sense yeah and maybe they attach certain very well-known investigators in the field to them and they, those mm. people promote it as well. Yeah. And then there's other places that are active, but there's just, you know, the meat, maybe this, it doesn't become a news item mm. or, or no one writes, you know, this bestseller about it. I think that has a lot to do with how all this works. And I mean, okay, I'll come out and say it. Amityville mm. was one because it was a, it was, it, had, it was a crime for one thing first. Right. And, yeah. and that got a lot of attention. And then because it was a crime that got a lot of attention, you know, Ronald DeFeo said the d- voices told him to do it. Well, then that just perpetuates everything else. Hmm. And then a family moves in and starts saying they have activity about it. And then that just, you know, then someone writes a book about it. And then that book becomes a movie. And then it just kind of steamrolls. That happened in England a bit with Enfield as well. Mm. So it's hard to ignore that. And I think those cases almost take on a life of their own, mm. despite whether or not you believe it or not, or whether or not any of it even really happened. Because both are in their own way controversial. I'd say Amityville more. Yes. But there's other cases that, yeah, I mean, or even places that, I mean, I've I've even been to, like, I, I mean, you know, when I traveled in England, like, you know, Warwick Castle has a number of fantastic stories associated with it, mm. but they don't become the focus of a bunch of books and movies, you know what I yes. mean? But, yeah. But Warwick doesn't hide it either, but it's just, it's just almost taken for granted. And maybe it's because something like Amityville happens in a place like the United States, which is, this isn't as old a country, you mm. know? Maybe this, or even in Canada, we have like the, I don't know a lot about it, but the Amherst yes. poltergeist. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But it, it hap- that, that happened a lot more in the past, so in more uh, frontierish times. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, it's, it is interesting, though, how some of these stories take off and some just don't. Maybe it's because people just aren't perpetuating them as much. I've always found it peculiar how certain cases, especially this, you know, here we are. It's 2021, and we're talking Amityville, prime example. You know, that's 40 years old. That case. Okay. Yes. Enfield, the end of the 1970s. You know, you can think of other places, and they're all of a certain era. And I was talking to Amanda Woober, Spookies, recently, and we were jokingly saying, where are all the disco ghosts? Where are all the, you know, <laughs> but where are they? It seems very odd that you seem to tend to occasionally get specific eras in time where we just don't get that kind of report. You know, we were being quite flippant about it. Jason, and it, but it is one of those things because, you know, obviously here in the UK we've got Victorian ghosts and highwaymen and Roman soldiers and certain things. But things like, you know, especially over the last 40, 50 years going out and, and disco dancing and people going out and having fun, we very rarely hear of ghosts doing that. Obviously there are plenty of haunted pubs and bars around the world, mm-hmm. but nothing as specific as oh, well, that's such and such, and he used to come here in 1976 because you can see he's wearing flares or something. Do you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to be flippant about the paranormal at all. I, you know, I love the, the, the subject matter. It's just little things like that often make me pause for thought and think, well, why don't we get those reports? Are people not looking for them? I wonder, too, if they've just been replaced. You know, like, now it's all shadow being, you know, shadow men and hat men. yes. And things like that, that it's almost more become generalized, mm. if that makes sense. But you're right. Like, I mean, you're, one place we, we investigated um, was, was another hotel here, actually, in my hometown. We got activity. And it was definitely more recent. You know what I mean? It was people who had died in the building recently. We were able to tie in, like, EVPs with these these spirits who had died in this building, you know, in the last few years. But it's not being widely picked up. I, I, maybe there's just something hasn't happened in such a way that it's gone bigger than just like a handful of people talking about it. I don't know. Like, yeah. but you've made a valid point. Like, there's very little uh, 80s ghosts even now, mm. which is 30 years ago, right? At a place. I, it's, that's really, that's a, that's a good point to make. It's, we seem to, seems like certain eras have just kind of peaked mm. in terms of paranormal popularity in general. Yeah. And now there's certain locations maybe that are getting more. Like, you see them pop up in these shows, which I can't, off the top of my head, I can't even remember some names, but, like, there's certain prisons and certain other sanitariums that have definitely had activity where they've been featured on a number of these paranormal TV shows. Yeah. But it's not like someone went and made a movie about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. Maybe that's what it takes to kind of capture that public consciousness on it. I don't know. 
Yeah, because I was, yeah. as you mentioned earlier on, been a subscriber of the 14 times for nearly 30 years. I love it. So it, it, it was interesting because I was having a, a discussion with a few people involved in writing for it or who have worked on it over the years, Jason. And we were, somebody mentioned the fact that hitchhiking ghosts just don't seem to get mentioned at all anymore. Or there mm. are no stories about these hitchhiking ghosts. And is it one of those things where it was an urban myth and now it just seems to have completely vanished because I can't remember the last time we had a hitchhiking ghost, especially here in the UK. We're still getting people seeing ghosts at the side of the road and, and things coming out into the road and people thinking they've run them over. Mm -hmm. um, so whether they've they've progressed from hitchhiking to just <laughs> trying to stop the car that way, I don't know, Jason. <laughs> but um, maybe they were sick of getting wet. I'm not sure. But it is very really interesting <laughs> how these things seem to be cyclical or, or fashionable even i think fashionable is maybe the word like maybe it is still happening but people just aren't talking about it mm. as much now maybe I, that could be it people have it happen they're like well i'm not going to tell anybody about this because they're just going to think i'm nuts maybe i am nuts coming back to what we yeah. were saying earlier right yeah yeah but people are willing to talk about shadow beings like yes. crazy you know and dog men and, and things like that and and even just um black masses it's almost that's become the a big thing too like i didn't see a ghost i saw this black shape that was darker than the darkness you know like that kind of thing people are definitely talking about more and maybe you're right maybe that now is fashionable maybe it's sexier than than some ghost hitchhiking on the side of the road so maybe our ta our perceptions of it are even changing mm. this, the, the, all this phenomena right i mean john keel talked a lot about how this has been a consistent thing forever and it just adapts itself to our modern world yes. and how we perceive things so maybe that's it yeah, I mean, because obviously there is a train of thought that says people see aliens and UFOs now, whereas 150 years ago they saw fairies and goblins. Well, and even back further, it was like chariots of the gods, right? Yeah. And, and during the Victorian era, it was airships. <laughs> yes. So uh, maybe that's just our, it's just adapting to our perception of it because it's easier for us to understand. Uh, you know, it's like you say, every time we come up, we think we've got something, it, it changes on us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, and, and that's a good point like you make in regards to shadow people and the hat man, as I'm sure, as, as you will probably agree here. When I was into the paranormal in the 90s, I couldn't tell you a, a shadow man case. I couldn't tell you a case that involved a hat man. They were just weren't reported. And then, as you, as you touch on there, Jason, is, is it that they were always going on, but people just thought they were too weird to talk about? Or... Mm -hmm. Has it progressed to then become something that wants to be seen now and people feel more confident coming forwards? That could very well be it. It, it makes sense, right? Mm. Um, it's almost like each thing in its time mm. as our consciousness changes. Because mm. if it has been with us, as people like you know Colin Wilson talk about and Kiel since the beginning, mm. it, it's it's probably gotten it's you know it's just adapting as we're it's evolving as we're evolving. Yeah. And our modern world is evolving, right? And we've got all this different technology now that can pick up on things and these new gadgets we're using, which are all un unscientifically tested. We're just trying to do the best we can with what we yes. got. Yeah, but yeah. it's, you know, being able to pick up with the spirit box using AM, FM frequencies, which, you know, when Peter started, I mean, I wish I had, you know, been back, been doing it back then. You use reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders because that's all you had. Mm -hmm. So everything's kind of just evolved. Like anything else, it's just an evolving field, and it seems like an evolving phenomena. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting. I mean, one of the the episodes you you did um, on the we want to believe is the is the episode that that focuses on the barn, which is a residency, mm -hmm. I believe. Parts of that that really struck me was one was that the the owner. It it's almost as if she was enticed into buying the property. Now, have I got that right? That she felt that she had some kind of feeling whenever she passed this place because she bought the, the property, I believe. Excuse me. Yes, that's exactly it. It was like she felt drawn to it when she saw it as a place to do business. Mm. And she, I can't remember what came up in the episode, but she has also been trying to sell it. Yes. <laughs> and no matter what, it's not selling. You know what I mean? At least as when last we spoke with her. Mm. Um, of course, the whole COVID thing means we hadn't been able to get back since we filmed. Mm. But definitely, yeah, she felt like drawn to it. She turned it into a place of business and she lives there part time as well. And it's, yeah, it almost like it drew her in and then things started to happen to her, uh, which were the water droplets sort of from out of nowhere. Which is very interesting. But yeah, and I've heard that happen to other people too. Like they, they, they end up living in a place that's haunted, but they always say, well, you know, I, I felt like I went by it and I kept going by it and I kept getting drawn back to it. I had dreams about it and I felt like I was being pulled in to this place. And, and I find that that's kind of interesting, actually, you know, that people are almost attracted to it. 
Yeah, and it, but why why does it want that particular person? Which is the thing I've always been intrigued by when these stories and these people come forward to say they have this kind of connection with somewhere, Jason. It's, well, what makes you so special? And I don't mean that disrespectfully to the person. Mm. It just interests me that whatever this is wants them, is attracted to them for some reason. I, I agree, and I, I wish I knew <laughs> you know yes. what that was. Yes. But, but I know when even when my wife and I were looking for a, a place to live, like we've been living in the same place now for almost 13 years, when we were hunting, there was one house that I, it kept coming up in the real estate listings, and it seemed really attractive, and we wanted to go look at it. And I remember we went to the house, and it looked great from the outside. We walked in, and the upstairs was nice, but it was this weird vibe. And then we went downstairs, and it was the most awful feeling ever. Mm. And there was a sense of oppression, and it was just it just felt gross. And even the realtor noticed it, right? Yeah. You know, and in almost every room there was a rosary, and it just felt. And my wife's like, I got to get out of here. And I said, Yeah. And as soon as we left that that house, we felt fine. Mm. But we there was no way we were going back. But it was weird. But we felt compelled to go there. Yeah. You know, over any other place, and it. But we just didn't. Obviously, what was there, we were just weren't going to put up with, live with it. I don't know. I can't explain it, but it's a, an exact the closest I've ever had to that. Mm. There's a pull to a certain house, and then, but we just didn't want to. It was just too much. Whatever was going on there, was just felt awful. Yeah. Um, but I'd love to go back and investigate it now. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. I mean, to be fair, if I went to view a house and there was rosaries everywhere, I'd I'd be like, right, okay, thanks very much, bye bye. Yeah. Well, and that's that's how we were. <laughs> we just couldn't couldn't be in there, right? Especially yeah. my wife, and she doesn't even believe in any of this, but she's just felt said something down in that basement felt horribly off. Yeah. Um, that's the only way she could put it. Um, but it was just, it was weird to go like, cause we were even, gee, we looked at it and everything about it seemed so appealing that we had to check it out and we drove by it a couple of times. And we ended up going there to get a realtor to go in and show us around. And it was just like, nope, <laughs> no way. Yeah. I mean, it is weird as well because I think the other aspect of this is that for a lot of people, sometimes they presume that everywhere that's haunted feels haunted, if that makes mm-hmm. sense, Jason. And like you say, it's more noticeable when you go into an environment like that where you get that feeling of oppression or or pressure on you that just makes you feel uncomfortable for whatever reason. And I think for a lot of people, it's the change in their atmosphere where they can tell something is about to start. Do you have you come across that a lot when you've been doing these investigations where it's it's almost like a switch goes off and the and something changes? Yeah, definitely. And it, and it's it's interesting because like the barn Mm. When we did the barn, nothing about the barn felt haunted or off. And even when we brought in Jen, the psychic, like she didn't really pick up on anything that felt in the space where, where the, the owner had the most activity. She didn't feel anything. Mm. Uh, but it was elsewhere in the property. And then even Bailey House, like it's there's nothing about it that really feels supercharged or haunted when we're there. But things happen. But then again. Like, you know, we've we've done investigations at residential schools where you can just feel at the moment you even you don't even have to go inside the building. Yeah. It just feels like it. And I just wonder if that sensation has more to do with uh, the negativity of an experience. Hmm. Like maybe if it, it's all caused by something like a past trauma or sadness, then that there's more that weight to things. Yeah. Then there is at places where maybe it's not it's not malevolent at all or, you know, it's just it's just there. Hmm. Then again, at the house that I live in, I, upstairs I feel fine, and downstairs I always feel a little bit of something, <laughs> you know, where my office is. It's just, it's just something different. That's where if I'm going to see something here, it's downstairs as opposed to up. Yeah. So, well, I don't least, know. Well, at least you'll sleep well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cause I <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, that, that could have been uncomfortable if you'd have told me the opposite. Right. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Paul. I'll, I'll think about that. <laughs> so... Um, I mean, one of the things I've heard you mention, which is, once again, Jason, is one of those things I think sometimes we just presume about countries, is Canada doesn't seem to be known for having haunted battlefields, which is mm-hmm. obviously living in the UK, you can't go very far without crossing something due to, you know, civil wars, invasions, whatever. And obviously America is the same with you know the ramifications of what's happened during the, you know the battle for independence and and the civil war yeah. there as well and i it's one of those things that until i heard you mention it i'd never really given that part of canadian history any thought so i suppose that's one of those weird things about canadian paranormal history is that is that you don't have that kind of history of conflict to that level where you have a well-known battlefield or an alleged 
ghosts that would congregate on such a thing. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had our, you know, our, our battlefields in a certain respect, mm. um, but nothing like, yeah, in the UK or down in the United States. If we're to get activity, it's more kind of in specific buildings or places. Um, and, and the stuff that we do have happen, a lot of it can be tied back to Aboriginal beliefs and their spiritual mm. side of their culture. Um, it, it comes more out that way or tra- you know, tr- places where tragedies happen. But there's, I've, I've never, I don't even think, I have to do some more research, but I, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of any specific place in Canada where you could go and there, you'd almost get those battlefield spirits like you do in the U- UK or the United States or other parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For that matter. We just yeah. don't seem to have it. I, I don't think we've had a, enough of strife in our history, if that makes sense. Yeah. That way, like we never had a battle for independence, or, or we had some, you know, so we would call them like Indian wars, but nothing even to the extent in the United States. Mm. Maybe just because we're more laid back. I don't know. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's more civilized, it's I one. suspect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm allowed to say but that. Definitely, yeah, there's places where people talk about you know the, the indigenous culture and their belief system, and then mm. there's definitely that aspect to things that comes up a lot. Yeah, very much so. And, and I suppose that's one of the interesting aspects of of like we were saying about that, because especially right now when you're probably itching to be able to sort of stretch your, your, your investigative chops jason and, and get out there to places you know such as gettysburg and the numerous sites all around there. Mm-hmm. it's it's one of those things that i suppose would be a really good indication of of an investigation but then again you think well is there any point in going somewhere like gettysburg because it seems that every ghost investigations team has done gettysburg it's a case of trying to reinvent the wheel are you going to find anything else or is it more of a case of doing it for yourself I think definitely there's there's like we there's places like we want as soon as we can go we want to go <laughs> you know like obviously um, and part of it is just more out of that own I think partly self interest yeah you know like Tombstone Gettysburg mm. um like a whole bunch I mean I'd even love to go to Amityville just to be outside and take a look at it right yeah. but I think as investigators we always want to just look for new different things and just that haven't been touched on a thousand times, especially if you're going to, you know, film it and put it out there for people to watch. We want to do diff- different stuff. And, you know, we like to focus on different businesses that, that'll let us go in and residential places that'll let us go in. I just think that's interesting for people. If it's something new that even a viewer could dis- discover as we discover it, mm. but to balance that out, like, you know, we would love to take the team to the UK and go mm. to various locations and get in. Cause Peter's from the UK. So he has connections over there, which I think would be awesome. Like, you know, the London Dungeon, Warwick Castle, mm-hmm. you name it. There's, I, when I was there, I lost track of how many places <laughs> I'd love to go back to and actually investigate. So I think it becomes, as, a, as an investigator, there's a balance of wanting to explore new things and maybe even put our own personal stamp, if we can, on a, on a well-known location. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, if you're into the paranormal, you've got to go to these certain places, regardless of your reasons for going there, Jason. Exactly right. It's it's I just it's, it's like your duty <laughs> to go yes. to these certain like the Queen Mary, you know. I, 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 there's so many. It, it's just like yes, I, you you have to you have to kind of see it for yourself and experience it for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, in the same way that you know people who you know who are, are uh, maybe some people might be offended, but are religious have to go to certain religious meccas yes. or places, right? Like mm-hmm. you just do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I even know skeptics who want to go to the Queen Mary. So yeah. Just cause, just say you'd went, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an invaluable piece of history, regardless whether you, you know, you want to go there to to be scared to out your wits. Because I remember, I think the first time I kind of saw anything about the Queen Mary was back in the nineties on sightings. Mm-hmm. When uh, I forgot the name of the the, the psychic, uh, the chap with the wonderful mustache. Um, I don't hear you speak of because we used to watch that show, but I, uh, God, yeah. that was a while ago. <laughs> I think it was called Peter P- Peter James, was it? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, and Peter Peter would go and and talk to, and I remember them doing the, the a Queen Mary investigation, and it was, it was very peculiar what went on that night. It was, um, and after that, I've always had a real interest in that that particular site because obviously it's a it's a, a a ship full of history, regardless. Uh, well, that's just it. And that's one thing I think that's nice about this kind of hobby. Mm. You know, profession is you do get to go to like some places that are, have real historical value. Yeah, they just happen to be haunted yes. <laughs> you know, at the same time, right? Like, so you get the best of both worlds. 
It's on my to-do list, along with a lot, lots of other places. I'd love to. There's so many sites I'd like to visit in, in the states to to really just, you know, like you say, tick them off the paranormal bucket list. I think more than anything. Yeah, exactly right. And same. I, I mean, I've got a long, long list. We have the opportunity to to go to Tombstone, mm. which is supposed to be quite an active spot. I think just be need just to go because of the history of it. Yeah. You know, the whole okay corral and everything like that. So. Well, yeah, exactly. You're killing two birds with one stone because, uh, you know, stories and the history of the Wild West are as enticing as the paranormal aspect of it, I suspect. Exactly. And then when I was in England, it was just everywhere I went, it was just, you know, the, the paranormal stories were cool, but everything around it was equally as, you yes. know, <laughs> cool and interesting. Yes, coming, um, as we were saying, you know, some of the pubs over here that are, uh, that are haunted that go back five, six, seven hundred years. Yeah, that's, which is crazy. <laughs> we have nothing like that here <laughs> where we can, you know, drink in a pub that's 700 years old. I mean, that's just awesome. <laughs> Very true. I mean, in, in regards to that, how has that kind of led you into working with Peter in regards to progressing your personal investigations? Because I, I believe you've, you've just released your first book together. But uh, the way I've heard you two discuss this, I suspect it's going to be the, the first of many. Yes, we are, we're working on two more, actually, right now um, for Beyond the Fray Publishing. And it's it's been neat because, I mean, like, Peter's done this 27 years, so he brings a lot to the table. Um, and so, like, just learning from him, the processes he's developed over the years has been been great, you know, and been honing my craft. And together we've kind of find we're almost like one plus one equals three, like, because he's kind of a magnet for stuff, so am I. And so it's just a matter now of sort of taking that and just seeing where we can go with, you know, this new team and this show, um, you know, and, and in our in terms of our exploration of it. And we like we want we take it seriously. We take it really like we have a lot of fun doing it. We take it very seriously and we respect it immensely. And whatever we do with it, we don't want to do anything to damage that. Hmm. Um, so whatever we do, we want to maintain. We want to portray the paranormal and investigating the paranormal as accurately and respectfully as possible to do justice. It has a hard enough time being taken seriously in mainstream anyways. Yeah. So we want to, whatever we do, we just want to keep pushing that forward in terms of showing it in a, in a positive fashion. Yeah. If that makes sense. And, you know, we want to take the teams to different locations. We want to try to travel to the, you know, the UK, all over North America, um, go to find new locations to investigate um, and just sort of, try to stay on top of the methods of investigating and bringing new those new forms as they develop into what we do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I suppose, is it one of those things that you were surprised how easily this book came together? Because it, it seems to be a case of you, you, you both seem to have let the genie out of the bottle when it comes to your writing. Yeah, it was, it was funny because it was on um, a show we did with Shannon on Into the Fray. Um, to kind of promote we want to believe and Peter was telling some of his stories and Shannon's like you know that those your stories would make a really good book Peter have you ever thought of doing that he's like nah you know if I have time blah 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 and I'm sitting there and in my head I'm like I could totally write that book because I had 10 years at newspapers I could write that no sweat so it was a matter of finding out if A. Shannon was serious about it which she was and then convincing Peter it was a good idea which didn't take much hmm. and then partly because of COVID you know just not being able to get out and about as much we had a lot of time to sit down and work on it um, we started writing last June. It, the first draft was finished in September, and we did multiple drafts and polish, and it was out right before Christmas. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's one of the benefits of COVID, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. We couldn't go out and shoot a whole bunch of episodes, but we could write a book. So, <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> so are you busy one way or the other. Absolutely. So are you planning to develop the, the themes of the first book and, and carry on that kind of historical? Because obviously this has a lot to do with Peter's years of experience because i think he's 27 28 years he's been investigating the paranormal now has he he has yeah yeah 27 be going on 28 here so is it a case of continuing peter's paranormal history or is it also adding new chapters to to your investigations and new experiences well yeah we're going to do sort of a bit of both like we're the one book we're, we're the, the working on two and one of them is going to definitely focus more on the residential hauntings mm. that he's been involved in and get a lot deeper into the the hauntings and then the processes that go on in an investigation because we touch on it throughout i want to believe but just take it even further and get make it more of a deeper denser book in a sense in terms of that aspect of it but you know keep it as entertaining and light as possible mm. and then another book we're going to do is peter over his years has made so many contacts all over the world so we're going to just sort of highlight different investigators from across the planet 
<clears throat> and their experiences and what got them into it. And so that'll be another book. And then I've always have dreams that, you know, as long as the show goes on, it'd be neat to take the adventures from the show and put them into book form mm. in some way as well. So do that too. So we got material, I think, for three good books in there in the end, and then we'll just sort of see what happens with it. Oh, fantastic. Well, that uh, collection of investigators from around the world certainly sounds like a very interesting concept, and I, I look forward to, to reading that. Well, thank you. I don't think it's been done. Like, I mean, mm. you know... The, there's been books like like we did with Peter about one person, but to have a book highlighting, you know, a dozen different people maybe, if we can, or however many we can get, and telling their story and the cases they've been on, I think would make for a really interesting reading. Yeah, very much so. Well, I wish you the very best of luck and look forward to diving into that. So uh, sooner you Thank can you. get sooner you can get that out, the better. <laughs> well, I think we're going to make it the next book. So <laughs> maybe it'll be done by you know out by the, this Christmas if we're lucky. <laughs> Fantastic! Oh well, excellent, excellent. And also, as you were touching on in regards to the series, I believe you just you've just launched a new new web series as well, haven't you? Yeah, it, it's called Hunting the Haunted, and it's on uh, the Paranormal Network, which is part of the Joe Blow Movie Network, and that's where um, you know we want to believe is now now featured, as long as some other great shows like that Bigfoot show and the UFO show. Mm -hmm. And Hunting the Haunted is is Peter and I dissecting well known and lesser known cases in paranormal history, and even some of Peter's cases as well. And the first episode came out on the 17th of the month, and it's um, it's about Amityville, because we figured that was a good place to start, mm -hmm. which is why earlier, Paul, we were talking about well-known <laughs> cases. It was like, the you know, it's just it's on my surface consciousness. Yes. <laughs> talked about it for 10 minutes on a YouTube video. Yeah. Um, but that's the whole point, is to look at these cases, talk about them, and then go over what supports it being a paranormal event and what supports it being maybe a hoax or a misinterpretation. And then we kind of pass our own little bit of judgment at the end. Ah, fantastic. And how regular are those going to be released, Jason? Once a month, just like we want to believe. So, and then we were working on it. So like every month there'll be a new episode of that, new episode we want to believe. And we're working on another one, mm. an interview show where we just interview kind of like what we're doing here. Yeah. But sort of in terms of like more of a 10 minute YouTube show, like just different people in the field, what they're about, what got them into it what they're working on that kind of stuff so and it's called quest for the unknown but we're developing it still but we're hoping to have it out here in the next month ah oh, fantastic well i'll look forward to that as well because i'm a big fan of your work jason both well, thank you thank as, you very much as an individual and with peter so i wish all power to you and before i let you leave it would be remiss of me not to touch on one of my favorite subjects which is big fun of course. <laughs> so, as He's a popular uh, guy, absolutely. <laughs> so, as as a gentleman that lives, uh, as far as I'm concerned, in in one of the ground zeros for Bigfoot, how on earth did you deal with that? What was that like? Because I would imagine it's perhaps a subject that you've known about without sort of diving into as as far as you did. Yeah, like we did. We were we we're, we did it. Oh, I, number of episodes for we want to believe where we really dove like literally dove into it as much as we could but growing up it's always been something i've been aware of i, I read every book i could on it and would watch every kind of tv show you know like in search of arthur c clark's mysterious world sightings mm. it, it was it was about bigfoot i was there man i was, <laughs> I was in it. but i grew up where i live Kamloops is unique and it's a city of like about a hundred thousand people so it's a major center mm. but if you drive 10 minutes in either direction you can be in the middle of nowhere yes um, which is interesting. And we, when I was growing up, we went to a cabin at a lake that was about an hour out of town. And I can remember certain times, like where I, I'd be out there by myself, and it would be like, you know, and I'd be like in my twenties, I'd be out there by myself, and I could be there for like a week, and I'd be perfectly fine. And then there's one moment where you'd just be sort of hanging out doing dishes, and all the hair would go up on the back of my neck, hmm. and I just get chills, like just this ominous feeling that there's something there that would just feel like I just could not be there anymore. And that's happened twice in my life, and I literally would have to get out of there because it just felt like there, I was being watched. Something was there. It didn't want me there, and I just had to go. And I'd be, I'd be there, and I'd have bears walk by, and it didn't, wouldn't affect me at all, mm. another wildlife. But it was something so, un, so unique feeling and unmistakable that it, you just felt it was time to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was, yeah. And it would be like the most hair-raising moments of my life, just to kind of, okay, it's time to pack up and go back to town. Like, just got to be out of there. Um, and when I was younger, I remember a buddy of mine and I, Mike Stewart, we'd be out there with my parents because I'd go out for a week and I could bring a friend and we were free range kids. My parents didn't care what we did as long as we were home, you know, for breakfast, lunch and dinner and nightfall. So we'd be off in the woods all the time and we'd always take the same route in and out of the woods. Mm. And this one path, we've been out there during the day 
we were coming, we came back, had dinner, and we just had to go back out and play around in the woods some more. And we took the same path, and underneath this tree that we passed, like just, you know, two hours earlier, there was a little lean-to built, a hmm. little fire pit, and inside the lean-to was a bone, picked clean. And it was none of that was there two hours before. And we kind of, that's just really strange. We looked at it, it was almost, but it wasn't people size, it was smaller. Hmm. Like little people size, for lack of a better word. And, uh, okay, yeah, that's strange. We kind of looked around, we walked a bit, and we just had that, that you know, that kind of same uneasy feeling I was mentioning? Yeah. It was like, dude, let's just go back to the cabin. Like, this is just uh, creeped out. And he's like, yeah, 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 let's go, let's get out of here. Went back to the cabin, but what we saw was the talk of that night. Hmm. Like, we were up all night. What was it? I can't figure it out. So first thing the next morning, first light that we could get up, we went out. We went back to that tree, and there was no sign that anything had been there. It was even kind of littered with pine needles. No trace of it at all. And we talk about that 30-odd years later, <laughs> and I can't figure it out. I talked to a friend of mine who's Aboriginal, and he's like, dude, that's little people. Because in First Nations culture, they believe in Bigfoot, but he's not yes. the only forest spirit. And there's little people that go along with it. And they're kind of like the guys that are like these scouts or whatever, and they kind of go out and look around. And at night, they go back in the caves, back into the spirit world. But if they can't get back in, they pitch camp, he'd tell me. Mm-hmm. And he says, you got probably came across a little person camp. <laughs> it's just like, great. That's uh, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of all my experience is re- Bigfoot related. But when we went out and filmed these episodes, we, we went looking for like, we found a guy who had been hearing wood knocks at the same lake for 20 years. So we went up to that lake and we went up there to see what we could find. The, the ab- for, Aboriginal gentleman I mentioned, Chris Bowes, we went out with him because he's had some Bigfoot encounters, went to places where he's had that. Mm. And then we we went out at night, overnight, on a camp to see what we could do, doing what we could to call out Bigfoot, and filmed everything, and it was a blast, an <laughs> absolute blast. Yeah. It is remarkable when I see some people that are, are in the Bigfoot field who live in Canada, some of the areas of the country they go into, it, it just blows my mind, Jason, at how remote it is. It is. At the one place, the lake we went to, we had to go like 50 kilometers up a logging road. We were in the middle of nowhere. You know, and you're kind of thinking, well, if, if Bigfoot's going to be anywhere, this is it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because there's nobody around and, you you know, there's no one that would bug them on a regular basis unless you went looking. Um, the other side of that is the scary side of it is like we're out here in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And we're looking for something that we don't know about, you know, yeah. or can't explain. And just what happens if you find it? Mm. Like, and I still couldn't answer that question on these hunts. If we'd had a direct face to face encounter, I don't know what I would have done. Yeah. Um, it is one of those things, I think, Jason, that regardless of how you feel in regards to whether you believe in Sasquatch or not, I think that the ramifications of being 50 kilometres away from anywhere and encountering something that, with the greatest respect, whether you are a believer or a sceptic, nobody can tell you whether it's carnivorous or not. Doesn't matter no. which side <laughs> of the fence you're on. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't tell me that people you can categorically tell me that Bigfoot's a vegetarian I'm sorry I'm not having that I refuse to believe it I don't care who you are unless you can show me them eating or having yeah. an interview where they discuss their diet I'm never <laughs> going to I'm not going to take that risk so you that would always be the biggest fear for me to be in a, such a remote location god forbid that you know everybody who believes in Bigfoot would love to prove it but I wouldn't mm. like to prove it by being the first person officially eaten by one no, <laughs> and you hear different stories, right? Like yeah. depending on which part of the world or, or even North America you're at, some of them are very friendly. Hmm? You know what I mean? But then you hear other people that have these terrifying encounters. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where so they're afraid for their lives. So, and I didn't know which side of the fence we'd fall on. <laughs> the one, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which it. it we were kind of because we put out some footage already, but I mean, one of like Sean is a part of the team. He brought a shotgun because he wasn't taking any chances. Even you know, you, there could be bears, cougars, all these other animals, but you just don't want to take a chance. Yeah, you just don't. Yeah, regardless, like you say, I mean, you you know, if you're in the wilds of Canada, you have to take precautions because of, with the greatest respect, you do have a large bear population and a large wildcat population. You've got to be careful. Yeah. You're dealing with wild animals, regardless of, of what, exactly. bre- what breed they are. And and even if you do stumble across an unknown animal, you want to, you want to be even more sure. Exactly, right? So it's just, you know, playing it as safe as possible. And we went out, like, with the utmost respect, and, you know, we, we did everything in our power to be you know, to be friendly. And, like, you know, Chris Bowes told he he do, like, prayers to the land, mm. which is a big part of their culture. If you ask to be there and show your respect and leave an offering, it grants you, you know, safer travel. So we did everything we could to guarantee that things would hopefully go the right way. So it, it was a great experience, and I'm sure we're going to do more in the future. 
even just as a group with Canadian Paranormal. So. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I'm glad to hear that, because I do, did enjoy that. And I found it very balanced as well, which was nice. It wasn't um, too far out. I didn't think you were pushing the boundaries of credulity. You were you were being very respectful, and, and it was interesting to see a, a more sensible approach to that kind of aspect to it. Well, thank you. And that's, that's like, like I mentioned earlier, that's how we try to approach everything we do, with, with respect to the subject matter, to the people involved, to the stories, and to the history. It's, that's the only way that I think I could ever do this, was to respect it as much as possible. Fabulous. Well, Jason, listen, it's been a real pleasure to finally get an opportunity to uh, pick your brains and chew the fat over several aspects of the paranormal and, and, and a little bit of cryptozoology there. So where can everybody keep up to date with you and find your work and, and follow your forthcoming adventures? Well, uh, all our episodes are, are at the Paranormal Network through joeblow.com. Um, we also, for we want to believe, we have a website. We uh, want to believe dot net. You know, we're a presence on you know Facebook and Instagram through we want to believe the series, uh, and then my work. You know, I'm on Instagram Jay Hewlett seventy two, and on on Facebook as well as Jason Hewlett, um, and Twitter as well. And so we're, I'm trying to be everywhere. Yes, <laughs> it's just hard to do. <laughs> Keep up with at all times. But if people want to find me, that's where. And then of course, um, uh, we came from the basement dot com also has episodes of uh, of we want to believe as well. Fantastic. Well, I'll put links to everything in the show notes as normal. And once again, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you, Jason. Thank you, Paul. It's my it's my pleasure. 